Hi everyone. I'm Katya, engagement coordinator for uh, CFWIJ. Oh, and Corinne is already here. Amazing, my guest. My today. Hi, Katya. Hello. <laughs> Great to see you again. You were really in a rush before, right? <laughs> I was like racing here. Um, I was so, so stressed out in case I was accidentally going to have to like do this interview from inside the car or like in the <laughs> middle of the time. Yeah, that would be something, you know, like reporters' life is very unpredictable. So like, why not? It's also Instagram life. So everything is like, you know, so, sort of uh, like talking on the way, right? So I think it would have definitely helped kind of the whole like journalism journalist on the go reputation but that really isn't an accurate representation of what I'm <laughs> mostly doing these days <laughs> yeah but you also know, that would be great you know like a reporter you've been to so many countries and you're always on the road so basically we can we can catch you only on the way to say we you know like cover the story. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. let's go honestly let's go with that theory but I mean for the last definitely for the last six months I've mostly been been reporting from yeah. I think like everyone um or at least like a lot of us yeah, we will, kind of yeah we, will talk, we will definitely talk about it so like people are slowly joining us so I guess like if you, if I may I will just make a short introduction uh so okay. like, we are interviewing today Corinne uh, Corinne uh, Redfern so also our member uh, CFWIJ member and correspondent for the Fuller Project multi-award winning outstanding journalist uh, who is focused on investigative uh, reporting that raises awareness of issues that affect women and their communities, also exposes various types of injustice and leads to accountability, which is amazing because that's what good reporting should do. And we will try to tackle and touch upon all of these uh, all of the parts of my of my intro, uh, introduction stories revolve and our call, our talk as well will revolve uh, around your pieces on child abuse of uh, discrimination women situation in brothers especially in bangladesh this very very uh, widespread shared uh, coverage that you did for, for the guardian and um, the yeah, discrimination in the southwest asia just to mention in general I hope I did it well. <laughs> Maybe. You make it sound a lot more impressive than it is, honestly. Oh, oh, come on, you're just too, uh, too, too modest, I think. So, so you are uh, based in Milan right now. That's uh, far I, now. Um, Yes, yeah. I, I, I hadn't really been planning to spend this year in Milan, mm -hmm. um, but in the way that I don't really think many people had been planning to spend this year in mm -hmm in a lot of ways um and of all the places to be I really I feel very lucky to be here um but yeah I'd been living in in Manila in the in the Philippines um and was kind of settled there mm -hmm. with an apartment everything um but I had I had some stories um that were due to come out um kind of around April May this year that could have posed a tiny security risk. Mm -hmm. um, and so when the Philippines announced its lockdown in March, um, my, my editors um, and I kind of decided that it would be best to, to hop out of the country for a little while um, to avoid being kind of locked down if, inside the Philippines if, if then Absolutely. the stories came out. Um, so initially, I went to Singapore for a little bit um, and had been planning. That was back when we thought this thing with the pandemic might only last a little while. Mm -hmm. um, but after about three months in Singapore, it was very clear yeah. that... Mm -hmm. We all thought that, right? right? And it's still in. And exactly. it's worse, so <laughs> we, I don't That's know, it. hope we will be just locked down in places that we were not supposed to be or like we are surprised that we are. <laughs> so we're exactly. <laughs> that was it. So... So my boyfriend and I decided we would mm -hmm. we'd head over to Italy instead. Um, yes, because I time. mean, exactly, exactly. Um, I mean, as you mentioned, like most of my reporting is on kind of human trafficking and exploitation, and there have been a lot of stories in Italy that I've wanted to do here for a long time mm -hmm. anyway. Um, and so yeah, now I'm here with a suitcase full of clothes that were kind of planned for Southeast Asia, um, and just trying not to die of hypothermia but aside from that it's great yeah so <laughs> can you tell us like what are you working on right now or maybe it's a secret and you can't share any details 
Um, so, I mean, my beat is very much around, just in general, around the exploitation of women, mm -hmm. whether that kind of forced labor, commercial sexual exploitation, um, you know, online sexual exploitation as well, very much falls into that category too. Um, the thing is that most of my reporting is quite long term. Mm -hmm. So that means that <laughs> despite being in Italy now for a couple of months, I'm actually still working on the stories I started earlier this year when I was still in Southeast Asia. So I have this very long list of stories I really want to start working on in Italy. But I kind of have to wrap up all of this, all of the, the work in Asia um, first. Yeah. So, so yeah, I think at the moment it's kind of, it's, I'm just doing a lot of that kind of cross-border reporting with a lot of phone calls um, and a lot of kind of, yeah. <laughs> A lot of teaming up with local journalists too, which is, oh, which is always That's right. Great. Yeah, of course. I mean, the thing is that if you really want to investigate and take a like full out and a very precise look on, on some story that is just evolving, you need time for that. And I'm really happy that you have this, I would say even privilege, because like many journalists just need to really like speed with the news and so on. And there is no much time left to actually cover proper story, right? So, and it takes time. And sometimes media outlets really forget that. It is a privilege, yeah. um, and it's not something I was ever afforded before joining the Fuller Project, to be mm -hmm. honest. Um, so I do feel very, very lucky. I mean, one of the stories I'm working on at the moment, I've been working on it for 18 months. Like, it's mm -hmm. a phenomenal amount of time. Um, and to have that, the trust as well behind you, that, you know, that this will kind of eventually, mm -hmm. like, it will eventually work out to be this, Hopefully, it will be worth that investment of time and resources. Um, but without without spending that time, yeah, you you wouldn't get. Absolutely. I mean, I, at least I I wouldn't manage to. Um, I, yeah, absolutely. I think it pays off. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, of course. Yeah. And that would be like my quick side note for every like editors in media outlets to just give journalists more time to actually have um, like, uh, which will enable them to proudly check some story and go to the, like check the sources and reach out to people and so on. I wanted to ask you like for a quick start, like we already like touched upon it, uh, touched upon it a bit, but uh, maybe maybe more details. Like, how does the global pandemic uh, influence your work? I mean, how do you how do you cope? I mean, yeah. So we touched on a funny bit. Like the geography has definitely changed. <laughs> <Yeah>. um, <laughs> I guess. I mean, aside just from the the general fact that obviously every every vulnerability that was there before that kind of fed into exploitation and trafficking, those vulnerabilities have all been exacerbated or are all being exacerbated and amplified by the pandemic. So I feel like even though I don't tend to do kind of, a, like I don't normally report on say, I don't very, do very many kind of public health stories, this crisis, you know, it's just affecting everything. So it feeds into my beat anyway. Yeah, um, and actually, like, I wanted to, uh, like, follow this, follow this thought, uh, because, like, <laughs> uh, it's normal, like, pandemic is uh, ongoing, it's getting worse, and we don't know what will gonna happen, so there is a lot of coverage, which is understandable, on which try to tackle uh, pandemic on different aspects, aspect, like, economic issues, like, the, how politicians are, are coping with that, or actually, they're not coping sometimes and the domestic violence which is on the rise and you took uh, also different uploads and i would even say i would even say that a bit overlooked angle uh, which means that in your pieces for example for foreign policy you outline the links between pandemic and human trafficking and saying that the coronavirus has created more people actually vulnerable to exploitation so i would like to maybe uh, if you could elaborate on that in what way and what were your findings also like relating to this article, referring to this article. Yeah, of course. Um, so I think the thing is, so I've reported on previous crises and kind of conflicts of climate change or natural disasters, like the Nepal earthquake in um, um, a few years ago and, um, you know, typhoons in the Philippines. They all, they all affect rates of exploitation and 
in some cases human trafficking um, because they, they obviously have an, an economic, a direct economic effect on, on the societies that have been, that have been affected. So in the early days of the pandemic, as soon as the reports started coming out about, well, yeah, about domestic violence, but also around you know, unemployment, mm -hmm. that's kind of, I think, what, I think it was the unemployment thing that first kind of really struck me that, you know, if everyone is out of work, then that's when people who are already vulnerable to, to kind of poor working conditions, forced labor, that's when those, those situations are just exacerbated. I mean, and in, if we look at say Bangladesh, for example, mm -hmm. um, many, you know, many women entering the sex industry in Bangladesh are doing so through, you know, from economic coercion, if not, you know, if not direct human trafficking, it's because, you know, they're, you know, they're in kind of dire straits financially already. Um, in the sex industry, which is incredibly exploitative in Bangladesh, uh, these women experience a lot of violence. Um, that is one of the only areas where they can actually earn a kind of a living wage. So all of those links are, are something that's kind of always, always at the forefront of my mind whenever anything big happens. Um, so what I wanted to do at the start of, of the coronavirus pandemic was speak with anti-trafficking organizations and with um, humanitarian organizations, international kind of large scale organizations to find out how they were factoring mm -hmm. this into their response. Like, I feel like people talk about human trafficking more and more. Um, it's, you know, it's in the headlines constantly. And, um, and yet, despite that, when I was speaking to these organizations, they acknowledged that the that people were going to be increasingly vulnerable, but they hadn't actually implemented that into any of their policies or their programs on the ground. Um, and it was very much something that they were aware of, but were taking very little action over. Um, so that's kind of what I was looking into back then. And that's something I'm going to continue. I mean, I am still <laughs> reporting on that. Yeah, sure. And you see, like this, uh, there is this um, mm, visible race in people who are like now uh, kind of forced to uh, to to be enslaved and to be a part of human trafficking, like due to pandemic. So, so I wouldn't say that there's at the moment. It's still. I mean, data is always impossible, really, when it comes to to issues around human trafficking um, and exploitation. Like with every kind of crime it's underground but also the nature of this one just makes it particularly hard to track mm -hmm. so that it's very anecdotal at the moment you know it's I will speak with one organization in in South Asia who will tell me that they have you know that they are aware of an increase in you know mm -hmm. and in the number of children potentially being sold into into prostitution um and sexual exploitation um but it, there's no there's no firm data on this at all mm -hmm. um i think um i think what's maybe slightly easier to track is activity online um so there's been a, a lot of conversation around the fact that um that online sexual exploitation could be it could be increasing mm -hmm. during the pandemic Again, there's no evidence that more children and more women are being exploited at the moment. That's something that we'll find out in the future. But what I was able to, to find out by, by working with various you know, amazing investigators whose job it is to, to really dig into the dark web, that there's an increase in the number of, of men, because they are men, um, from Europe and, and the US who are spending more time on the dark web searching for images and videos of, of children who, who are being abused. Um, mm -hmm. And the majority of these children come from countries like the Philippines. Um, yeah, exactly. And you, wrote, you wrote a piece on, on the thing that uh, the exploitation of children and online abuse actually soared since the outbreak. So maybe we can uh, like, like follow yeah. up with this with this spot and with this piece that you wrote like some other yeah mm -hmm. yeah of course so 
so again, it's not, it's not quite so clear to say that the number of children being abused has gone up, but the demand mm -hmm. for the imagery and the videos has gone up. And whether that then feeds through to, you know, um, whether the increase in demand then kind of trickles down the system to mean that then there are more children being exploited. That's something that the, the experts who I speak to predict is likely to happen, mm -hmm. but it's too early to say, because it's also because it's happening right now. It's happening inside, it's happening behind closed doors, but also during the pandemic, you know, these are children who they're not going to school anymore. People aren't kind of, people aren't going to maybe spot the signs that they might have been able to spot previously. Um, the investigations themselves have also just been limited. Um, like in, in various regions, especially in Latin America, I was speaking with some investigators who told me that you know, they, they would only have a limited number of kind of cyber crime experts anyway. And they were, they were very much having their, their resources kind of redirected to, in order to, to impose, you know, safety protocols, social, social distancing, you know, the pandemic regulations. Yeah. And so they were having their attention kind of directed away from, from online sexual exploitation, which was then continuing in the background. And then at the same time, sorry, I'm just going to go on about it. But um, so while all of this is happening, and even if there isn't an increase, even if at the end of all of this, we find out that it was the same number of children who are being exploited. Um, what I was able to find out was that in the Philippines, which again is kind of one of the main countries um, where, where online sexual exploitation takes place, um, many of the, ch the children that usually they have teams of investigators who would spend weeks, months researching a report of sexual exploitation. Um, it's not a quick process. They will be, they're very thorough. They will kind of, they'll make sure that they know it's happening for certain before they, before they would try to remove the child from, from his or her family. Um, but during the pandemic, um, one police chief told me that she had identified a child. They had completed the investigation. And at that point, they would normally step in and immediately get this, mm -hmm. get this child out of the situation and into safe, a, safe, a safe place. Um, but because of the pandemic, the shelters were closed. Um, they were at capacity, you know, or there were quarantining regulations. So they couldn't accept new, new children. And there was nowhere, there was nowhere to take them. So the police were having to you know, abandon these children to, to their exploiters um, and their abusers kind of for a, an indefinite period of time until the, until the situation changes. Yeah, that's, that's awful to hear. But like the thing is that pandemic is making uh, all of the forces concentrate on other uh, types of activities. So this... Um, these things like mm, trafficking or like ch uh, children, ch children abuse is maybe not overlooked, but maybe they are not at the full capacity to like operate like before, right? So, thank you. Absolutely. Yeah, um, we already you already mentioned Bangladesh, so of course I also I also wanted to to refer to that to your um, um, very uh, the your your amazing your amazing but very. Like, moving i would say it was very very hard to read your your piece for the guardian uh, about girls uh, and situation in brothers in bangladesh so i would like us to focus a bit on that right now and you wrote about lavoni who was 13 years old when she was uh, enslaved and trafficked uh, trafficked to to sex work and first thing is she needed to flee her husband and she was 13 so this is already a big red flag and something terrible uh, but this is like the, only the start of the problems and left her daughter she was 13 so still i need to repeat that because like uh, for especially for people in europe we hear about all of this stuff but somehow said so very often it happens a bit in a distance in some other regions so we know about it but sometimes we really need to 
reiterate and repeat that it's really happening. It's really harrowing and and awful. So I um, I wanted to ask you how did you uh, co come across this story? Like how how did it start that you started investigating? And then we will talk more about the whole process, of course. But like how did it start? So it kind of started a bit backwards. Um, I so it was 2017 when I started reporting mm -hmm. on on sexual sex trafficking and um and exploitation in mm -hmm. Bangladesh um but it was so it was early in that year when I I was very lucky and I received a grant um to to investigate issues around child marriage mm -hmm. in Bangladesh and I was living in Nepal at the time um so I I contacted a friend um Alison Joyce who's actually also a member of the coalition mm -hmm. um and we were we were talking about it she's a photojournalist li who lives in Dhaka and so my initial instinct was always to team up with her anyway on this story to do something around child marriage it was an issue that she both she and I had worked on previously in India um back in like 2015 and um so so that was the plan, was just to investigate child marriage. Mm -hmm. And then to kind of look into, I was interested to see how child marriage could act as a precursor to other forms of abuse. Mm -hmm. um, and it was really Alison, because you know, she was living in Bangladesh, and it was her who suggested looking at whether or not it was feeding into, you know, kind of actually into sex trafficking, and whether the girls who are ending up in the brothels across Bangladesh were ending up there because of because they'd been married off when they were like 10, 11 years old. Um, it was very much a hypothesis at this point. We thought this would be interesting to look into, but we, you know, we, we really don't know whether or not this is what we're going to actually find on the ground. Um, so we spent, we spent initially, I think we'd planned, we planned to do the whole story in about 10 days. Like that was the initial amount of funding that I had you know, it's so expensive as well um, to do this kind of reporting. You know, we needed a, a local journalist, um, a producer, and we also needed um, a translator to work with us mm -hmm. as well. So just to kind of flag up immediately, there's no way I could have done this story without without this, this kind of financial backing. Um, but we got to, so in, when I got to Bangladesh, we, we kind of, we headed out to, to the oldest brothel in, in the country, which, is, which dates back over a century, around 150 to 200 years old. Mm -hmm. and, um, and the way to kind of picture these brothels is really, they're kind of like little villages. Um, you have like 800 single bedrooms along these kind of narrow streets, about 50 little shops or businesses you might have a hair salon in there it's kind of like a little walled off town within a town usually kind of on the edge of a larger city um so we headed to to one of these and that was the plan that we would spend kind of 10 days in this in this brothel um getting to know getting spending as much time as we could with the girls and, and gathering what we could um but the process was very slow. Mm -hmm. um, my priority and Alison's priority was very much we wanted the girls that we were speaking to to be as comfortable as possible, mm -hmm. um, which means you know spending a lot of time kind of sitting, literally braiding each other's hair, um, and like listening to music, drinking endless amounts of tea, um, until eventually you know we would kind of build up a bit of a relationship and enough to to really kind of start talking about mm -hmm. about some of their stories um and it was over the course of doing that over that the, that first week and a half that we realized how big this story was and that every single girl i spoke to had been married off as a child at 10 11 years old mm -hmm. um they hadn't known what was happening to them they had been like off playing with their dolls when someone would like a parent would have called them into a room and dressed them up in a in a wedding sari um and then like halfway through the ceremony the child would have got bored and like run off to play hide and seek with her friends mm -hmm. and then like 
that night she would have been shipped off with a man who is like three times her age. Um, and that's incredibly common, you know, I mean, in many, many regions around the world. Um, but what we discovered was that so many of these girls, you know, they're, they're so, they're so like smart and strong and brave and like, Absolutely. When their husbands were abusing them, these older men who had raped them every night and kind of and beat them and, and treat them in unimaginable ways, these girls weren't going to stand for this. Like they they wanted to get out, and so they you know they were running away. Mm -hmm. every, so many of the girls I spoke to had just run away in the middle of the night. They'd snuck out and tried to run back to their families, but then their families had had rejected them and the girls were then they then decided generally they would try to they would head to Dhaka the capital city to try and find work in a garment factory um if this sounds a little bit like I'm generalizing it I swear I have heard this story from so like hundreds of girls one after another with obviously incredible you know each one has their own variation Absolutely. the similarities are just so strong um and so generally they'd be on their way to, to Dhaka when they'd be at a bus stop or a train station um, and a woman would approach them. And the woman would often have a child with her, um, maybe a baby. She would be kind of very kind and motherly. She would approach this, you know, this 11-year-old this girl, this 12-year-old girl. Um, and often by this point, you know, these girls were often very upset and scared. You know, they might be crying. They were very, you know, they were traveling to this to the capital for the first time that maybe never been there before. And the, this woman would, would kind of offer to help basically would say, come back to my house. You know, I'll look, I have a friend who works in a garment factory. I can get you a job. Um, come back to mine, stay the night at mine. I'll feed you. I've got a bed for you. Tomorrow we'll go, we'll find you some work. Don't worry. Everything's going to be okay. Sure. And the girls would like, you know, this is all they wanted was someone to kind of take care of them in this moment. So they would follow this woman back to her home and they'd maybe stay there one night, two nights, three nights, drop their guard until eventually the woman would introduce a, at this point, generally introduce a man and tell the girl, look, this man will find you the job. He's a good friend of mine. Mm -hmm. Maybe he's my brother, you know, go with him. He's going to, he's going to take you to the factory. So the girls would then follow follow the men you know maybe travel across the country again but they that at this point they're just trusting him yeah of course like they and he would and he would take them to the brothel and uh, mm -hmm. and sell them in usually during night like by nightfall um so it was only when they then woke up the next day that they realized where they were um and by that point it was it was too late for them to to get out mm -hmm. yeah so, so it's mm -hmm. um, yeah i mean it's yeah yeah, it's Sorry, Graham. sounds uh, horrifying, and this is like uh, how you how you depict that, and <clears throat> of course, like how how it is uh, how it is managed. Let's say it's like the whole mechanism, right? Because this is this first this lady who is like trying to uh, gain the trust, and of course, she's also very um, very kind and helpful. So why 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 not why not to trust her? And uh, step by step, then. Uh, let's, yeah, let's face it, selling them, right? Like selling them to, to be, uh, to be sex slaves, to be abused and, and raped every day. So this is like the big, big mechanism. And also when you mentioned that uh, there are like villages, so it's like basically community within the community, right? Like there is, I mean, the, it, maybe it's designed the, that uh, it's, prob it's probably designed to uh, make sure that they are not leaving. And this is like, they are just stuck there, right? And this is the only reality they know. I think it also provides them with an element of support, though. Mm -hmm. I think, you know, okay. these are these, these brothels where, you know, again, you have like 600, between 600, and I think the largest one I visited had 3,000 women and girls. Yeah. Um, and at some point, for many of them, you know, they've experienced endless abuse outside the brothel. And inside mm -hmm. the brothel, they're all, there is almost a kind of, kind of complicated sense of solidarity in there as well, mm -hmm. where the, the women are, you know, they're, they're all united with kind of shared trauma. Mm -hmm. um, and 
after a while that you know the out the idea of leaving that system and going back out you know kind of out into the wider the wider world as such doesn't hold very much appeal to no. many of them yeah of course like what 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 can they do also like with no contacts with no family just basically landing on a street you just in different city probably right so yeah like Exactly. Mm -hmm. And the amount of money that they can earn in the brothel is also significantly more than a woman can earn in like a garment factory in Bangladesh. Um, so even these girls will be trafficked in and, you know, they'll be, they'll experience incredible trauma and sexual mm -hmm. abuse for such a sustained period of time. But for many of them, it will also, you know, it will also feel like it's the best, mm -hmm. like the best opportunity they have available to them. So it's very complicated, and um, it has and, um, layers to that. that. Yeah, so that's basically how I've ended up reporting on this for the last yeah. three years, rather than just ten days, because it's just a lot to unpack. Yeah, absolutely. And when you were talking to these girls, like uh, you, you remember how how it how it was, and like what did you feel, and how did they react? After you also, you needed some time to gain their trust of, as well, right? To to speak about their lives. Yeah. Um, I mean, every, every woman and every girl is different. Um, okay. And what we found was that, I mean, the vast majority of, of the women and girls we spoke to really wanted to talk about what they'd been through. Um, they don't tend to talk to each other very much about mm -hmm. their story, about kind of life before the brothel. Um, one girl told me that that was because it was too painful for her to kind of to think about life before like life before she'd been married um and so it was something that i think some of them some of them were very well, most of them did want to kind of mm -hmm. sit down and kind of and really talk it through and we would end up kind of doing these these interviews that i would go into thinking okay I'm going to go very slowly with this and maybe we'll just do like half an hour mm -hmm. today, you know, and then she would start talking and nine hours later she would still be talking <laughs> and I would be sitting there kind of changing batteries in my dictaphone like, oh my God, I'm going to run out at any moment. And the translator I was with would just be like tirelessly, you know, working through this. And these, you know, these girls would just be kind of just unraveling everything that had ever happened mm -hmm. to them. Um, and that was, yeah, I mean, that, I mean, everything about journalism feels like a privilege. You know, we were talking before about the privilege of, um, mm -hmm. of having time to do these stories, but also just having time to hear, having the opportunity to hear people's stories. So being able to just sit there in a girl's bedroom for nine hours as she, you know, as she just, un, you know, unpacks everything that's ever happened to her. Right. <laughs> I, yeah, it's um, I feel very, very lucky that these girls would, would trust me with their stories. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And great that you could uh, bring these stories to the broader audience so more people could read about them and actually uh, be more aware what's what's happening. And thank you for that. Uh, I also wanted like to uh, touch up on one thing in, uh, when it comes to your coverage on brothers and sex trafficking. Uh, so following one, uh, following one of your articles, <clears throat> uh, like you, you mentioned in your article that there was a, a ban on public burials, right? And following your articles and maybe some kind of, it shook the public and so on. One local government began allowing uh, actually sex workers or like uh, girls from uh, girls working there uh, to arrange formal funerals. So that was kind of I don't know how to uh, because like I don't want to use the word positive, right? Like considering the issue, but this was kind of a glimpse of hope that some things can go better, let's say, or there is some positive influence. Let's say, sorry, I use this word in positive. Anyway, uh, so I wanted. To, so your reporting, uh, what I what I meant to say is, your reporting leads to uh, impact on the official level as well. So could you <clears throat> do you maybe remember? Could you tell us maybe more examples of some kind of glimpse of hope and and positive uh, effect of your reporting? 
I mean, I, I def, I would love to be able to take credit for for that for the change in public burials, but I'm sure you know. I think that was a long time coming. I think mm -hmm. um, you know, the sex workers themselves have have been campaigning for that change for a long time, um, and um, and so and also. You know, it was it was definitely a huge positive that that burial took place. Um, I I would like to to see that happen more frequently before I I can kind of sure. feel too confident in that change. Absolutely. Um, but I I mean I do I do see there are there are signs of there are signs of of kind of of hope. I guess on the on the horizon um and I guess in terms of um I mean I guess the thing that probably I found most encouraging since we're beginning to report on this three years ago is that when when Alison and I first started looking into this um no one was we were the only ones who saw the link this link between child marriage and sex trafficking. Mm -hmm. And I would be calling up every NGO I think that works in Bangladesh and asking them, you know, what are you doing about this this connection? And they were like, mm, I don't know if there is a connection there. And I was like, oh, okay, wow, you're, people are missing something there, definitely. Um, and and over the last three years, like especially in the last year an increasing number of those NGOs have now started kind of reaching out and saying, oh, hold on, we're, we're looking into this now too. And actually, you're right, there's, there's something there. Um, and we should, we should be factoring this into our programming. Um, because the thing is, there's a huge number of these of programs and of projects in Bangladesh that, that work on, that work on preventing child marriage. Mm -hmm. And that's hugely important you know obviously getting girls to stay in school getting families to keep girls in school and um and enabling you know just you know stopping girls from being married off under the age of 18 is massive but what i realized from from speaking with families speaking with with the girls the young women themselves is that there's no support when the girl gets married so as soon as if a family mm -hmm. doesn't take any of these projects seriously and then marries her off at the age of 13, 14 years old, that girl is then living with this man several times her age and she's not receiving any help then. The projects are very focused around school. She's no longer in school. She's not getting access to any help. That's when the abuse takes place. That's when she runs away and that's when... Yeah. The, ones, the girls I was speaking to would then end up being trafficked into into the brothels um so the fact that these these ngos are now looking at okay what can we do to to kind of target this specific demographic of of girls who are, have re been recently married off underage that i find very encouraging um and then another another kind of more legislative mm -hmm. piece of i guess impact is um it's kind of hammering home the same point, but the United States, um, the State Department has this massive report that they release every year. It's called the Trafficking in Persons Report. Um, it essentially grades every country around the world on how well they're doing in terms of combating human trafficking. Um, it's very, very influential um, because if a country performs badly, then the US can impose sanctions and might you know, restrict financial aid for the following year. Um, it's also argu arguably a very problematic report in that way. Like the US consistently gets this, the top grade despite its own policies that have been shown to, you know, to harm trafficking survivors. Um, and it very much focuses on measuring human trafficking um, by the conviction of the traffickers rather than looking into the factors that drive trafficking in the first place. Um, so kind of after yeah at no point at no point in the in the report's history over the past 20 years had it acknowledged that child marriage 
was cause was one factor yeah. that was yeah. causing these these rates across the country. Um, but then this year, they finally made that link, um, and yeah, that I, that I was kind of happy yeah, about. Yeah, like, yeah, just I, I kind of whooped and jumped mm -hmm. in the air a bit when that happens. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, sure. I completely agree. This acknowledgement is crucial. And in your pieces, you always try to sort of link, right? The child marriage and uh, sex, uh, sex slavery and human trafficking, because especially when it comes to young girls, it's, it's always connected, right? Because this one abuse is replaced mm -hmm. with another. So there is, there is a link there. There are not like two separate situations, right? Like we can't be blind. That's it. On that. Exactly. And I think that when a lot of people are reporting on on human trafficking, there is a tendency to report on it through the lens of of the trafficker, as in with a focus placed mm -hmm. on the trafficker, and on how many how many convictions, how many traffickers have been convicted, yeah. you know, in a certain country in a certain time. Um, and it's all very well, you know. There's a merit to those stories, but there's also if the focus is just placed on, on looking at the trafficker, um, I feel like you need to take a step back essentially yeah. and look at you know, what is it that's making these girls vulnerable to trafficking in the first place. And unless that's taken into account, I don't really see how, how change will ever happen. Absolutely. Yeah. You can keep convicting the traffickers, but there'll just be more traffickers coming in. Yeah, and you don't um, to the court. The, the solution is making girls less vulnerable. Yeah. And absolutely. kind of providing the, the protections that they um that they would need. Yeah, absolutely. I, I totally agree with you. Um I wanted now ask you like um about your reporting work per se, let's say, like maybe for, because we will be finishing soon, I'm observing my clock, <laughs> I don't want us to be hang up like in a second, uh, like it suddenly, <laughs> right, it also probably can happen on Instagram, uh, so like you work in difficult environments and on difficult, very sensitive issues, and uh, I would say that many people would prefer, especially some kind of authorities, maybe security forces, like sometimes they are also linked to this sh shady business, right? especially in Bangladesh, maybe they would like to swap it under, uh, under, swap it under the rug. And you put yourself uh, on a spotlight when you, when you start digging, when you start reporting and trying to get more information that which will be not favorable for certain people, right? Uh, so I wanted to ask you, have you encountered a dangerous unsettling uncomfortable situations while working on these stories as a reporter so i guess the first thing i would flag up is that obviously as a you know as a white british reporter <laughs> i'm entering these situations with a ridiculous amount of protection that just comes with me and this privilege that is you know that mm -hmm. um that really facilitates a lot of access to situations okay. um, and in certain, certain places and countries mm -hmm. that I, I wouldn't be able to access otherwise. Um, and also does provide me with a level of protection. Um, I'm very aware that when I'm working in these, again, I've mentioned earlier that when I'm working in these brothels, I'm not working alone. Um, you know, I, I have, I am always with a, you know, local translator, but also um, a local producer. So, mm -hmm. And what I, I often find quite difficult ethically is that in many cases, they don't, they can't have their names on the piece at the end. Um, sometimes they can. It depends on the story that I'm working on yeah. or that we're working on. Um, but sometimes the repercussions for them would be, would be too great it would be too much of a risk and so there are pieces that come out when it just ends up with my name at the end mm -hmm. and it's very much been a team a team a team project but the dangers that these reporting on these situations pose to them are very different to the dangers that are posed to me mm -hmm. so that's just something that I'm very aware of um I think when we talk about you know yeah, hostile environments, we often focus on the foreign correspondent and not necessarily the local journalist who's, you know, who can't just leave the country when things get difficult. Like, 
I mean, again, we mentioned at the very beginning of the call, the whole reason that I'm in Italy is because, you know, there could have been security risks um, attached to some of my reporting in the Philippines. But the fact that I have a passport that allows me to then leave the Philippines mm -hmm. and yeah. spend, the, you know, and have spent the last six months elsewhere, that, yeah, it's, um, it's something I'm, I'm very, you know, very grateful for, but also, you know, I think, I do think there needs to be more discussion around protection for, yeah, absolutely. for local reporters yeah. specifically. And I would like to add um, another segment to my question. Like you mentioned, like as a, a white British journalist, you feel that sometimes you're, um, you can enter places which are usually not accessible to, to, the, uh, to the others, let's say. But uh, also you need it, like you're one of the reasons you left Philippines because there, there could be some uh, difficult situation, let's say. Uh, so I wanted to ask, have you seen that, have you noticed that fact that you're a woman and reporting and being on the ground in very often in the hostile environment and patriarchal, uh, patriarchal environment, does you see this, uh, that it has some kind of an influence that you're a woman, woman journal? I think it very much depends on the story that I'm doing. In some, in so many cases, yeah. it's an advantage because you're constantly underestimated mm -hmm. and most of my most of my reporting does involve speaking to men in the it tends to be men who are in the positions of power yeah. um and they're the gatekeepers and to to many of the stories that i'm working on and because they they all see me coming in as this blonde youngish woman they will they will grant me access um because they won't necessarily grasp what it is that um they i mean they won't yeah they they will just completely underestimate the kind mm -hmm. of story that i'm working on sure. um i i find that when i'm reporting on american men or or european men or australian men yeah. <laughs> um they they're the ones who who probably threaten me more often to my face um they're the ones who who are more direct in mm -hmm. their in their misogyny in that respect um and yeah that's mm -hmm. it's just it's a very that's very different um and yeah i think it's i think honestly it's only ever been when i'm reporting on on men from kind of high income countries mm -hmm. that I've actually felt directly concerned for my own, for my own well-being and the kind of needed to, to kind of mm -hmm. work around that. That's an interesting uh, note. Important, very telling. I understand. In interesting note, really. Uh, yeah, like uh, for the, uh, for, for, uh, for, for the conclusion, like my last question for you would be, um also like re regarding your your thoughts and your reporting and how you're operating because yeah as uh, as we already mentioned that like it's impossible that these stories that you work on which are so sensitive and there are like lots of drama and trauma there that they it's impossible that to just stay cool and not affected right they they affect and you think about it plus when you're you're, you're a great reporter so you're like once you're in the story just story becomes the most important thing, right? You just need to cover and, and find out more layers to it. So I wanted to ask you, which can be also the some kind of advice for other uh, journalists and reporters, um, how, uh, how do you find the time and space to also take care of your mental hygiene and mental health in all of that? I think it's something I'm still working out. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, I, I had like a, a solution that I could give to, to other reporters. Yeah, but the um, like we, also, we, always, I, we need to cope, so it's like, you know, like, or, or yeah. work, right? Yeah. Exactly, exactly. But I'm definitely still working out. Um, I'm still trying to get better at that. Mm -hmm. um, I'm trying to get better at taking breaks mm -hmm. and kind of seeing the signs of when I'm, <laughs> when I'm not sleeping so well and realizing, okay, now I probably need to maybe book a couple of days off work and put my phone down and, um, yeah. and try and clear my head. And um, I'm trying, I'm, I 
didn't used to be very good at that. And I'm, I'm trying very hard to do that more at the moment. Um, and also, I think, I mean, the, the coalition is fantastic. Um, in general, I think, and again, also the Fuller Project, you know, there's a lot of us in the same situation. Mm -hmm. You know, there's, there's a lot of women reporters around and we all, like, in various WhatsApp groups and various people who, I think just, I will end up talking to people a lot about mm -hmm. yeah. when something's weighing on me. Um, and, you know, whether that's a colleague or, you know, just someone else who's, who works, you know, in the same kind of environment. Mm -hmm. and, um, and just kind of feeling like we can all share that mm -hmm. experience and kind of work through it. I find that helps me a lot. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. I'm not great at bottling things up anyway, but, um, and also sometimes um, I've also developed a thing very recently where, or at least my boyfriend has developed a thing where at about two in, two or three in the morning when I can't sleep because I'm so just wound mm -hmm. up about everything, where he will make me kind of get out of bed and he'll make me wear boxing gloves and hit something at like three in the morning until I wear myself out and then I just crash out. <laughs> That's, a, that's probably my only advice. Tip. And you have, you literally no punching something. You, have, you said you have no advice, and this is a great one, really. <laughs> so focus your energy. I mean, you know, do. <laughs> is it? Very important. Yeah, but I totally agree yeah. with you that this support network of women journalists and yeah. like reporters that can understand what you're going through, and they can also share your experience. And talking about it, it's it's amazing. And This is what we're trying to do at the coalition, and Fuller Project tries to do it as well. So I, I hope, like, I'm, I'm glad that it's working. It um, makes so much difference. Yeah. It really does. Yeah, um, this a sense of solidarity. I guess it's it's really crucial. Like, yeah. exactly. Mm -hmm. So, uh, thank you, Corinne, for today. It was a great, insightful talk, and I enjoyed uh, listening to you and talking to you a lot. That was amazing. Thank you for your time. And thank you very much. Thank you. That was that was perfect. And uh, I'm gonna say goodbye to our followers. And you can also like this uh, live will be archived, so you can you can watch it later if somebody didn't have time or needed to leave. And thank you so much once again. Have a lovely day. And uh, I'm so jealous that you're in Milan right now. <laughs> I needed to say that. I'm sorry. <laughs> I know. I'm very lucky. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you so much, Katia. Bye -bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.